hope you are all enjoying Twin Cities Drupal Camp. And how many of you went to the keynote? I thought that was very excellent. It was very good information. My name is Amber Matz, and this is Blake Hall. We'll introduce ourselves in a second. This is Get Started Developing with Alexa and Drupal. And like I mentioned, I'm Amber Matz, and I am a production manager and trainer at Drupalize Me. And I'm uh, Blake Hall. I'm a senior developer and trainer also at Drupalize Me. Um, I really enjoy playing around with sort of using Drupal in weird and interesting ways, like having it power your Alexa talking to you. Um, so yeah. That's the inspiration That's for the me inspiration. roping Blake into this talk. So I was uh, playing with, I saw a tutorial, or no, it was, a, it was just a, a video on the internet of someone had hooked up their Billy, big mouth Billy Bass animatronic fish to an Alexa, an Echo Dot, and had made the fish talk, of, make, made Alexa talk through the fish. That completely inspired me, so I went out and got an Echo Dot. My husband and I, we, we must have this in our house. We must have three of them on each wall in all of the major bedrooms. So this was uh, the inspiration for this talk, and I'm glad that Blake could join me to, uh, as we were like, well, how can we make this work and integrate it with Drupal? So what we're gonna cover in this session is first we're going to look at concepts related to designing a voice interface. As web developers, we're used to designing user experiences on the web or maybe even a mobile app, but designing a conversational interface is new territory for many of us, um, or else it's, so, it's still pretty fresh and new. Amazon has some excellent documentation and resources for developers on this subject, and I'll be drawing from those resources as we talk about uh, these concepts. We'll also talk about concepts and processes related to actually implementing and building a custom skill. So there's some terminology that it's really helpful to know as you're going in because you're going to have to contend with these terms as you create your, your app. We'll look at actually creating your first skill and what is the easiest path to get started. And then we'll look at two different ways to integrate data from a Drupal site into an Alexa skill. And finally, we have some fun demos at the end. There are several types of Amazon or of Alexa skills. And when I say Alexa skills, I mean the skills that are their voice applications that are compatible with Alexa enabled devices. So like the Echo Dot um, and there's a variety of other, you know, there's several different, there's like three or four different devices. Is anyone not familiar with an Alexa enabled device? Or how many of you have an Alexa enabled device at home? Like an Echo Dot or what are the other things called? Uh, the Tap. The Tap and the actual Alexa, uh, the show, which I don't think is actually yeah. it. The Fire TV and Sticks have it. And then there's the, the alert. Yeah, and then there's also like the apps as well. So, um, so that's what we're talking about, is specifically integrating with this Amazon Alexa ecosystem. And so there's several different types of skills that you can build for this ecosystem. Uh, one of them is custom skills or custom interaction models, and that's what we'll be focusing on today. There's also smart home skills, so things that can integrate with, you know, lighting and, and other things like that, you know, smart home. There's a thing called a flash briefing, which is a basically a glorified RSS feed. So it's a voice RSS feed. And we actually, we won't be focusing on that, but we do have a demo of that at the end. And then there's a new one, there's a video skills API, which is brand new. We won't be talking about that at all, but it's a thing. By the end of this presentation, you should feel empowered and ready to create your own custom Alexa skill with or without Drupal integration. To get the most out of this presentation, you should be an intermediate coder at least, comfortable tinkering with code, copying and pasting skills are a must, and, but you don't have to be a node expert or a web services expert uh, to create an Alexa skill, even though we'll be using those technologies. It's a, it's a very accessible development experience. 
Um, if you've already created an Alexa skill, stick around. Uh, we'll go beyond the basics here and maybe you'll pick up something new. Designing a voice user experience or a conversational app is a new experience for many of us. As with any application, before we dive into code or configuration, we should take a step back and look at how we're going to design our app from a higher level. The first step in the process of creating an app for use with an Alexa-enabled device is to design the voice user interface or experience. How are users going to interact with our app? So to start things out, let's talk about things that we need to consider when designing a voice interaction model. While it's fine to start out with a few contrived examples to learn the process, which we certainly have done, to really become an excellent voice controlled app designer, you want to choose projects where adding voice will make the task faster, easier, or more fun. We're not here to make people's lives more cumbersome, tedious, or downright miserable, okay? We want to help people out. And when we're choosing projects, we want to consider these three things. So for example, what's faster? Setting a timer by walking across the room to the microwave and setting a timer, or even going through screens and buttons on your phone to set a timer, or saying, Alexa, set a timer for three minutes, or we saw Joe this morning say that. Hey Siri, set a timer for 12 minutes. So is that faster? Arguably, yes. Uh, thinking about making a task easier, think about how someone might usually perform a task with their hands or needing their, to view a screen with their eyes. How might that task be made easier through a hands-free, eyes-free interaction or request? Maybe even think, think in terms of making the task more accessible or safer even, um, as in the case of, you're not gonna carry around an Echo Dot in your car, but this is certainly the case when we're dealing with a Google or Siri voice interaction. So some of these concepts definitely cross over to that realm as well. So for example, is it easier to control the playback of a song with a voice command, or is it easier to play a song via screens and buttons and through apps? Well, you know, that's another arguable case. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but those are the types of questions you want to think about. Is this, am I going to make it easier for someone? So more easy examples. So what we're going to term as single turn dialogue is easy. So you're asking Alexa for the weather and she tells you what the weather is or asking Alexa for a joke and she tells you a joke and you laugh and the interaction is over. So there's no further interaction. But multiple turn dialogue, like if you're creating a game or you know some kind of interactive model where you need to ask for information multiple steps along the way, it still needs to be easy. And this requires more design work up front and more exploration of all of the possible paths of interaction before you really dive into it. So you need to be able to explore interaction in various ways. And as you know, from talking to people, conversation can happen in many different ways and it gets interrupted and people phrase things differently and there's many different ways to, to phrase something to get the same result or outcome. So designing for fun. You still wanna make it easy, but games, for example, can be an interesting challenge because in order for a game to be fun, it needs to be a challenge. Games that are easy are boring. So you want to design a game to be easy to play, but challenging to win. You can also look for ways to incorporate humor, surprise, or delight in your interaction, if it's appropriate. And finally, if all else fails, like if, if that really just doesn't apply at all to your project idea, maybe just think about how do you want users to feel after the interacting with your skill? Do you want them to feel frustrated and are they like throwing the Echo Dot across the room because it was so stupid? Or are they like, cool, awesome, like that was awesome. Or are they laughing? Or are they, did you put a smile on their face? So think about how you want users to feel before, during and after your interaction with your skill. 
So in conclusion for this section, be choosy about the projects that you want to add voice to. Be particular about what aspects of your platform you want to expose to voice interaction. Ask yourself, do, will adding voice interaction at this point for this particular task make things faster, easier, or more fun for the person actually using this? If the answer is a resounding no to all three of these questions, you probably want to rethink your project idea. So, how do we actually go about this process of designing for voice? There are several steps to get started. So first, we want to determine the purpose of your skill. And this is going to just be an overview, and we're going to go through each of these points. We're going to identify user stories. We're going to write out dialogue for the happy paths, where everything goes well, and that's just going to be a starting point. We're going to diagram the user flow. And then finally, we're going to create the interaction model. As developers, you may be tempted to start with your API and just add commands, voice commands for each endpoint. You don't want to expect users to know your API, and you shouldn't make that assumption. Start designing your voice skill with a script, not with code or your API. So first, what's the purpose? One of the first challenges, and this is a hard challenge. It's, it's hard to think of good ideas for voice interaction. But one of the first challenges is deciding what type of project is a good fit for voice interaction. Spend some time describing some scenarios in which people will find your skill desirable. Think about why would people want to use your skill? Maybe think about what a person would be doing before, during, and after interacting with your skill to help you envision the context in which your skill makes sense. Also, think about what someone would get from your skill that they can't get any other way. Once you've determined the purpose and capabilities of your skill, identify user stories and the individual steps and actions a person will need to take to interact with your skill. And so as you do this, think about what can someone do or not do with your skill? You don't need to do everything and you can't and you shouldn't want that. So also think about like, okay, we're going to do this, but we're not doing this. What information is a person expected to have available when they interact with your skill? What features directly support the purpose? And is there information that they're going to need from an outside experience or website or application in order to successfully interact with their skill? Like, are they going to need some kind of a uh, you know, piece of information or an ID number, or are they gonna have to know the name of something, or what is it that they're gonna, they're going to probably need to know something, even if it's just the name of your skill. And so what is that piece of information that they're going to need before they can successfully interact with it? So we start with a script. You want to start out with a very simple, brief script between a dialogue, between the user and Alexa. You want to make these interactions very brief. At first, focus on the happy path where everything goes well. So there's a successful interaction. And as you're writing out these scripts, think of different phrases and um, phrasing that could be used or how the interaction could go in different ways. So think about whether or not the dialogue flows naturally or not, or is it awkward and like, I sound like a robot, even though I'm a human, I'm gonna make people talk like robots, you know, are you doing that? Or is this actually a natural thing that makes sense in kind of a conversational context? So like I mentioned, keep the interactions brief, write for how people talk, not how they read or write. So maybe grab a partner and Try, try these scripts out in the real world instead of just staying in your head and writing things down. Indicate when the user needs to provide information, if that's part of it. Okay, so now we've got, we've got our purpose, we've got a script. Now we can use this script and diagram the flow. So we want to reference that happy path. We're just gonna start with that. And we're going to map out all the places where we need input from the user, if necessary. And then 
after you've done that for the happy path, branch out and start to look at your edge cases and start to look at what might go wrong or what if they say this and what will happen with that or error cases like do they need ex extra information or do they need help or are you expecting them to know a list of 10 categories and they want help for that so how are you going to handle these kind of like oh, I don't know, what about this? And so start to branch out all of the additional use cases. So for our simple example, the user says, Alexa, ask fish jokes for a silly joke. And Alexa responds, why are salmon so good at using Git? They love to merge upstream. So we have our script and we have a very basic flow diagram. So we can simplify this where we say, okay, Alexa, we're gonna say, Alexa, ask fish jokes for a silly joke. And I'm putting silly in brackets because that could be silly or nerdy or um, a fishing joke or a boating joke or whatever category that we have. So that's like a placeholder for a category. And then Alexa is going to return a joke tagged with the term silly from our Drupal site, fishjokes4.life. So we could also expand this diagram by um, diagramming what should happen if the user asks for a category of joke that we don't support. Is there, you know, what's the default response and how is that going to work? Are we just going to return the same one every time or are we going to return something random from a list? And you can already start to think about like, oh yeah, I could use views for that. Um, or I can, I know how to construct a query for that. And your programmer mind will start to think about like, oh yeah, I know how to do that in views. So, okay, yeah, I'm going to implement that in my, my script. And, I, and so at this stage, you want to diagram those other cases. If you find that you're starting to branch out and you're uh, diagramming out all of the different interactions and your flow diagram is starting to get really complicated and deep, it, you've probably got a problem. So you probably want to step back, simplify, reduce the number of kind of extra cases and start simplifying things and go back to literally the flow diagram drawing board because and go back to your scripts and maybe reevaluate your purpose. So if you get to this stage and you've got a flow diagram that is just insane, then it's time to go back to the beginning and rethink your idea. The final step in the voice design process is to actually implement this and configure and create the interaction model. This is an actual implementation step and is a key process in creating a custom skill and it's something that we'll go over. Um, in this step you want to take your flow diagram and you want to ascertain what are the concrete things that can happen in this interaction. These are called, these are our intents. And what are the specific things that people can say to invoke those intents? Those are our utterances. So to recap, when designing the voice experience, be choosy about your project. Does adding voice make it faster, easier, or more fun? Determine the purpose. Identify user stories and the context in which your skill will be used. Write a script between the user and Alexa. How does the dialogue go? Does it flow naturally? What are the different ways that people could say things in order to mean exactly the same thing? Is it natural and conversational or is it tedious and cumbersome and awkward? So aim for the former. Use the script to create a flow diagram and identify each concrete action of the happy path as well as other possible outcomes during user interaction with your skill. And the last step in the process is to create the interaction model. Since this is a key implementation step, we'll be looking exactly how an interaction model is assembled later on in the presentation. To read more about designing for voice and the processes and concepts involved, check out alexa.design slash guide. That's a shortcut URL that will take you to their, their uh, voice design guide. There's some excellent uh, short videos and articles about these concepts, many of which I just told you about, but there's more information there. And 
the design, the voice design guide is just full of different ways of presenting information to help you understand the concepts. So they have not just text and articles, but they also have some other interactive things and videos. So you can check that out at alexa.design slash guide. So there are four terms that we're going to be throwing a lot, a lot, we're going to be throwing around a lot in this session that are key to designing an Alexa skill. In fact, we've already mentioned two of them in the voice design process. These four concepts are activation, invocation, utterance, and intent. So let's look at our example user request in more detail. Alexa, ask fish jokes, for a silly joke. So let's break this down. Alexa is the activation or wake word. This is how you start a conversation with your Alexa-enabled device. Activation words can be these four words only. Alexa, Echo, Amazon, or computer. They are fixed by Amazon and can't be customized. But they are configurable by device. So if you have two Echo Dots in your house, for example, you could configure one to be uh, Alexa and the other one to be Echo. In fact, that's a really good idea unless you want to create an Echo Chamber in your house. Ask Fish Jokes is the second part, and this is the invocation. This tells Alexa where to send your request. So yours is not the only skill on the marketplace. There's many different skills, so how does Alexa know where to send the request? It's through this, um, this invocation statement here. So open, launch, ask, plus your skill name, that is how your skill is opened. And it's those specific words. So that's something that a user is going to need to know before they can interact with your skill. So to ask, access our fish joke skill, a user could say, Alexa, open fish jokes, or Alexa, Alexa, ask fish jokes. And then finally, for a silly joke is the utterance and intent. This is passed along to your skill and determines the response. Utterances are the phrases your skill will recognize. This is your opportunity to think about the variety of phrases users might say to interact with your skill. So don't just think of one way to, to, to ask for something. Utterances can use placeholder words or slots to make requests more dynamic. We want to configure multiple sample utterances to provide many paths for user success for when a, someone is interacting with our skill. Intents are a behind the scenes way for your skill to support multiple kinds of requests. Some Amazon intents are built in, such as help, stop, and cancel. So that's really super handy because every skill should have these and those are available as a, a built-in intents. And there's many other built-in intents that you can find in the documentation. So put together, these three concepts are the tools you will use to design the interaction users will have with your skill but you're gonna focus on utterances and intents as you design your interaction model. So like Amber mentioned, we're gonna take a look at a couple of different sample implementations. Um, when we built these originally for uh, the presentation in, in Baltimore, that voice guide didn't exist yet, so we pretty much ignored most of that adv advice and just sort of hacked away on something fun. Um, but it's sort of, this, this market is really evolving pretty quickly and the documentation is miles better than it was three months ago. Um, but let's just kind of walk through sort of some high level simple examples of, of what we're talking about. So this is sort of a, a flow chart for how the typical request comes in. The user makes a request to the device, Alexa gets triggered, it figures out which app it needs to launch, that then hits an endpoint or executes some code to figure out the data that's gonna be returned that gets sent back to your device and it's read out to the user. Um, one of the things we'll talk about is this Lambda service that's part of the Amazon Web Service package. That's a really convenient, handy um, service that Amazon provides that basically just executes code when your app is, um, when it's triggered. 
So rather than having a server running continuously that maybe doesn't respond to requests very often, it basically just spins up when it needs to respond to something. So it's really resource efficient. Um, they're still running promotions around Alexa development. So if you publish an Alexa skill, uh, once it's been live for a couple of days, they'll give you promotional credit to run uh, Lambda service. So the actual free tier is pretty generous. And then if you publish a skill that becomes a little bit more popular, they give you $100 a month in Lambda credit. Um, so basically, you don't have to worry about paying for it, which is pretty cool, at least for now. Um, the other neat thing about Lambda is Amazon has a GitHub repository that has a bunch of sample code and blueprints that you can get started um, taking advantage of. They, uh, they include code in Java, Python, and Node.js. So if you're familiar with any of those languages, you can just grab one of those and get started. Um, we'll be using Node in these examples because I'm much more familiar with JavaScript than I am the other languages. Uh, the actual Lambda functions themselves we'll take a look at in both the user interface and code examples in a couple of minutes. There are two examples, um, two demo examples uh, we worked on. The first one is basically a copy and paste job from one of these blueprints that has a hard-coded list of jokes in an array. So what happens when that, uh, when that particular skill gets triggered is the Lambda function spins up, grabs a random element from the array, and returns that joke. So that's a really kind of dead simple skill example. The second one does a similar thing, but when the Lambda function is triggered, it makes a web service call to get a joke from our Drupal site. The joke is returned back to the Lambda function, and then it's returned to Alexa. So that one's a little bit more complex and is pulling data from Drupal, uh, but still revolves around using the, the Lambda function, uh, the Lambda service from Amazon. Um, and then the third example we've got is it cuts out Lambda entirely and has the endpoint configured right on our Alexa scale to just hit our Drupal site directly. And then Drupal handles the request from Alexa and the response to Alexa. So we don't have to rely on the third party uh, AWS Lambda. So there's a few things that you need to do before you can get started creating an Alexa skill. First, you need to create an Amazon developer account, and you'll also use this account to access AWS if you want to use Lambda. So AWS is Amazon Web Services, right? I think so. And then next, you want to sign in to developer.amazon.com and navigate to the Alexa tab. And then click Get Started under the Alexa Skills Kit. Uh, there's quite a few uh, docs and resources. Some of them are a little non-intuitive to get to, but they are continuously improving. And there is now a portal page for many Alexa developer resources. So this is a great place to find out like the latest information, any kind of new resources that they've provided to uh, developers to help you understand the concepts. So this is a great place to find all of the relevant resources related to developing an Amazon skill. You can also find the docs for creating a, an Amazon skill um, by clicking this getting started with the Alexa skills kit. So once you log in and you've clicked on that get started with Alexa skill, you're going to see your dashboard of what skills you already have in development or published. And then at the top in this paragraph here, you can click this link. And to access the docs for the custom skills, navigate in the sidebar to custom skills, expand that menu, and then click on that top understanding custom skills. So this is the relevant uh, docs for custom skills in particular. So links to specific docs um, also exist in line in the configuration screens. So you can also just like dive in and you know, and, and try your best. Um, but if you need to go back and start to dive deeper into the docs, that's how you access them. So click add a new skill to get started. And Alexa skill development consists of both configuration and code. So there's two pieces to the puzzle here. We're gonna start with this, start the process with configuration. We're gonna get to a certain point 
literally the endpoint configuration, and then we're going to realize, oh, we need an endpoint. So it's time to code and create our endpoint, and then we're going to come back to the configuration and complete the process of in configuring the endpoint and testing it out and submitting it for cer certification. So the first phase of our configuration, we're going to define our invocation name, the name of our skill, and tents and utterances, which is a part of our uh, interaction model. And the configuration is just going to bring all these skill components together and it's going to tell Alexa how to, re uh, how to direct what, what Alexa is getting from the user into your application. Okay, so first off, the invocation name, it identifies the skill. The, uh, the user includes this name when initiating a conversation with your skill and it must be unique. This, um, these skills are part of a marketplace, so this is how a user is going to, um, uh, they're gonna know at least the name of your skill and in, when they're looking at the marketplace, they'll be able to see what the invocation name is. So the first part of the form, uh, you want to, to um, provide some information about your skill. You need to first define the skill type and we're gonna do custom interaction model, uh, which um, is the first thing on the list. So, but if you're doing some of these other things like smart home, flash briefing, or video skill, you'll need to, so you need to decide up front what type of skill you want. And then uh, there's two names. And these can be the same, but they just have different conventions as far as like how you can name them. And the first name is how they'll find it in the app, in the marketplace. And the second, the invocation name, is what they're actually going to say when they interact with it. Okay, so the next configuration section is where you define your interaction model, your intents, slots, and sample utterances. Intents represent actions users can do with your skill. This is the core functionality of your, of your app. Um, intents are the map between the utterances we created and the code that we'll execute. Sample utterances, you will specify words or phrases users say to invoke intents. And again, you, you're gonna map utterances to intents and this map forms, forms the interaction model. Slots are like arguments and views. They're optional arguments. They need a type, they need a set of values. So this is sort of like in the Drupal world where we have a, a taxonomy vocabulary and we have a specific set of terms that are a part of this and these are the only terms that we're going to accept. They can be custom or built in. Um, there's a new feature in this Alexa skill configuration and it's called the beta interaction model. So when you get to this um, stage in the process, it'll say, do you want to try the beta interaction model? And you should, you should try it because it's way better than the original form. Um, the original form consists of basically three sections, your um, intents, and it's like a JSON, uh, uh, it's a JSON structure. So you're like co immediately confronted with, oh, what is this? <laughs> and it's just not very uh, intuitive at all. But the beta interaction model is. Um, so this is the beta interaction model dashboard. Here you can see an overview of the intents and the slot types you have already con configured. When you first open it up, it's going to automatically add the three, uh, the cancel, help, and stop intents that every app should have. And um, so that's gonna already be set up for you. Um, the first thing that you'll do is you'll create a new intent. So we're gonna add our first one, um, get fish joke. And then having created that intent, so you can see, there's our intent. So you can see the get fish joke intent, and now we want to uh, type out some sample utterances for the, this particular intent. So here's a few, tell me a joke, or give me a joke, or make me laugh. Those are all different things that users could say to get the same result, a corny fish joke. So um, some guidelines for sample utterances don't include uh, Amazon or Alexa or Echo in your sample utterance and don't include the name of your skill. So this is just the last bit. Um, the Remember we talked about those three 
three parts of the interaction, and this is just the last bit that the user needs to say. Do include a wide variety of phrases, and if you want to include some uh, dynamic terms, um, you can use this, these slots. And if you want to include a slot, just open up a curly brace, and you can see here when you open when you type a curly brace, this little pop-up widget comes up and you can either select an existing slot type or you can create a new one. So you can actually just stub out your slots in, in this part of the configuration and then you can go back later and you can add more slot types. So you've got the slot name that is a part of your utterance and then you need to have create a slot type which is like your taxonomy vocabulary that you need to map map that to. And then you're going to create values for your slot types. So this is just a placeholder. This is just the curly brace and the slot name. So here we, we have our slot name is category. And you can see that in, um, uh, in curly braces there. And then over on the far side there, you can see the intent slots. And we've got this slot called category. And it's got this nice machine name list of categories. So then we need to config, if we're using slots, we need to configure the slot type. So you've got the name of the slot type, which is category, and then here are the values that are accepted values for the slot type. So what's nice about the beta interaction model is this all kind of flows very naturally and you can kind of stub out things in the sample utterances and then you can go back and configure the slot type and it fills things out for you. And then you, after you save your model, you can go up to, if you're curious, you can go up to the code editor and you can see the JSON structure that is output. And so this is the end result. Um, and you can see that in the code editor. And you can even, actually you can import um, a JSON structure if you already have one, um, or if you have some sample code from Alexa's GitHub, um, you can just drop it in here and then you can, um, edit it either in the code editor or through the the user interface so it reads that structure and then you can so you can have a starting point you can bring in some sample code drop it in and then you can edit it with the ui so creating an intent schema this json structure is the ultimate goal of configuring the interaction model this json structure is what actually declares the set of intents your skill can accept and process so this isn't magic, it's just JSON. Um, it's best practice to include Amazon's built-in intents for common actions such as st stop, help, and cancel. And you'll see these included in example blueprints like on GitHub, uh, Alexa's GitHub, but they're also automatically included um, if you use the beta interaction model. Um, so here's a closer look at the intent schema for a basic example. You can see in this example, get new fact intent is the name of the custom intent. This is followed by Amazon's uh, built-in intents. Um, you, you'll also include slots, as we've mentioned, in your intent schema if you're using them. So here's an example of our fresh joke skill that uses a slot to allows, allow us to respond with categorized jokes. So there's our intent key, and, um, and then Below that is slots and the name of the slot and the type of the slot. So not all of the intents use slots, but you can see uh, where they are there. So after you've configured your interaction model, it's you get to this stage, endpoint, and you realize you don't have that yet. <laughs> so now it's time to, to uh, write some code. We actually need an endpoint to provide functionality to our skill. So, like we mentioned before, we'll take a look at three different of these endpoint examples that sort of increase in complexity. Um, one of the things that Amber sort of alluded to is this, this new beta interaction model, GUI, is really slick. Um, they didn't have that when we first built skills, so we had to learn what that JSON structure meant and represented with just reading the docs, which uh, was confusing and kind of a pain in the neck. Um, so, so far, based on what we've configured, we can make a request to Alexa. Alexa would actually um, 
understand the pieces of that request, try to pass it off to something, but not have anything to pass it off to. So we have to figure out sort of what the back end of our skill is going to look like. So again, like we've mentioned, copy and paste liberally from the blueprints that are provided. The sample docs are code-wise really good. Um, and Amazon's Alexa GitHub account has a bunch of these in a bunch of different languages that you can sort of start from. So when you're getting started, I would highly recommend using Lambda, at least to get going, so you don't have to worry about keeping your server running. Um, any server that responds directly to an Alexa skill has to have has to be running HTTPS with a non-self-signed certificate from a certain certificate authority. And there are a whole bunch of details about how the JSON in responses have to be structured in order for it to, to work. Um, so using Lambda kind of cuts out a lot of that overhead, and makes things a little bit simpler to get started. So again, our simplest example, we're just using Lambda to pull up a hard-coded array of jokes, grab a random value, and return that back. So Here's the intent schema again. It's pretty similar. I didn't even bother changing the one from the blueprint that was get new fact. I started uh, this particular skill with one of the blueprints called space facts and just replaced interesting space facts with bad fish jokes. Um, but this is, this is sort of what the JSON looked like. These are the only three utterances. So um, in the old form version, you just type these out. Um, you don't get the nice little helper text that's in the beta interaction model. The actual Lambda code itself is might be a little hard to read here. It's on, all of this stuff is in uh, a repository called Fish Jokes on my GitHub page at Blake Hall, if you want to grab it and kind of follow along. But basically, we've got this language string array that handles uh, different languages if you wanted to support Fish Jokes in other, in other languages. Um, we only have values for English, but it's a bunch of um, not actual jokes. These are fish facts, but um, there they are. And then the code itself, um, get new fact will be triggered whenever a request with that particular intent comes into Lambda. That runs the get joke function, which pulls in that array, grabs a random element out of the array, and then does this emit event tell with card and the speech output, which is the text of the joke. So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, even if you're not super familiar with code, understanding this probably isn't incredibly complicated, or if you're not familiar with JavaScript anyway. So the next example makes it a little bit more complicated and pulls out that hard-coded array and actually makes a call to a web service. So we're still using Lambda here for the endpoint and handling the sort of handshake process but we're using views to provide the data that will actually return jokes. So the intent schema, again, it's the same. Um, Amber mentioned how it's recommended to keep those built-in intents. I will uh, provide a, a good reason for that. If you don't include those, which I didn't in my first skill development, um, and if you also have your endpoint improperly coded, your uh, echo may just repeat the text that gets returned over and over and over and over and over again with no way to get it to shut up aside from unplugging it. Um, so at least, at the very least, the stop and cancel are, are good options. Um, help is obviously useful too if, if your skill's a little bit complicated. The utterances again in this example were the same. Um, here's the, the Lambda function code. So we're making a request to the joke me please URL on our fish joke site. On the Drupal side of things, this was just a view created to return JSON um, and grab a random uh, joke content type piece uh, and send back the, the JSON structure for a node. Uh, and then after we get the response, we, we parse it as JSON, we pull out the title and the punchline, we concatenate them together and return that value. Um, so again, this isn't super complicated code. And if you know how to get Drupal to output JSON, um, it's, it's pretty easy to build uh, an Alexa endpoint that uses uh, your Drupal site and the data from your Drupal site. So on the Drupal side of things, like I mentioned, it's just a dead simple view that grabs a, a random joke content node. Uh, and the display type is rest export using JSON. So super simple. <laughs> 
The one that's a little bit more interesting is sort of cutting Lambda completely out of the picture and just relying on Drupal. Um, when Amber first talked to me about the idea of doing this presentation, I got really excited about it and then realized I would have to figure out how to handle the JSON that Alexa sends in a request before I could bother responding. And the idea of parsing all of that JSON was a little bit, not intimidating, but I wanted to make sure I was going to handle all of the edge cases properly. Um, and I was a little bit nervous about just the amount of work that would go into doing that, especially given the deadline we had for getting ready for DrupalCon. Thankfully, this is Drupal we're talking about, so um, there's already a module that handles all of that for you. And I learned after Baltimore that it, the module itself was actually put together for Dries' keynote uh, a, a couple of years ago. So it's available on Drupal.org. It's not covered by the security team uh, and the security policy. There are a, a few pieces of functionality I'll show that the module itself doesn't support yet. I haven't uploaded a patch. Uh, it's on my to-do list, but not very high, apparently. Um, so on the Alexa side of things, or on the Drupal side of things, once you download and install the Alexa module, you tell Drupal what the Alexa application ID is. So any requests that hit your endpoint, if they don't, if they're not coming from the skill that you configured, your Drupal site won't respond, basically. Um, you give Alexa the resource callback. That's basically the URL endpoint that you'll then put in your Alexa skill configuration so it knows what URL to hit to actually return data. And then you get down to writing some code to actually return the response. So uh, what the Alexa module basically does is it uses a PHP library that knows how to understand the request JSON that's coming in from Alexa, and then it emits a, an event, a symphony event. Um, so in your code, you implement um, something that will subscribe to that particular Alexa request event, and then it'll trigger the on request method. So inside of that on request method, you'll have the different intents that are coming in from the actual request. So in this case, if somebody asked, asked fish jokes for help, it would just return the text, you can ask anything and I'll respond with a fish joke, um, which isn't super useful, but it's an example. Um, and then any other intent, I didn't bother implementing stop or cancel in this example like I mentioned before. Um, any other intent, we first check to see if, if a slot came in, if there was a categorized fish joke being asked. Um, and then we run an entity query that grabs a, a joke node that's been published. If we have a term name, we add a condition for a joke with that term name. If we don't have a term name, we just hard code it. Um, I initially failed the Alexa skill validation process because we had a list of 10 categories that were possible options and I didn't have enough content in the site that was tagged in every category. So their testing script made a request for a category that didn't actually exist and it failed and I had to fix that. Um, but on the Drupal side of things, this, this code isn't super complicated. It's, it's an entity query uh, at the end of the day and we, we load a node. And then we build up this card response object. Um, you can pass URLs, you could pass MP3 files, you can, you can pass sort of all sorts of extra metadata, and then you just respond back with the text uh, that makes up the contents of the response. So again, if you say, Alexa, ask fish jokes for a silly joke, now that we have this Drupal version configured, the response that comes back will look something like this on the Alexa app on your phone. Um, and that image field is coming from your, the Drupal site as well. So it's, it's relatively straightforward and, and pretty easy. And then one of the things I learned about uh, shortly before Baltimore but didn't get a chance to dig into until recently is how to control the actual pronunciation and um, the way that Alexa sort of speaks back to you. Uh, the module actually supports this already, which I didn't know in Baltimore but would have been kind of cool. It uses something called SSML, which is Speech Synthesis Markup Language. Uh, there are four different extra HTML tags or extra markup tags, basically, that you can add to your response that Amazon will understand. That will allow your Alexa to do things like whisper certain words in a response or substitute certain words. Um, you can also emphasize one over the other. You can change the pitch, rate, or volume. Um, and probably most importantly, you can bleep out expletives. Um, I certainly would have used that in a demo if I knew about it earlier. Here's sort of what these tags look like. They're, they're relatively straightforward in terms of 
you can probably look at that and guess what each one of those does as far as, as the markup goes. They're really well documented on, on the Amazon docs. And like I said, the, the Drupal module actually supports these SM, SSML responses kind of out of the box, which is really cool. The one downside that I have done a little thinking about but haven't really figured out how to solve yet is what would this look like to a content editor? If you were building an Alexa skill on your Drupal site, would you put in a WYSIWYG tag that makes an SSML markup in your node? Um, I don't think these voice interfaces are old enough that we have a good answer for this yet, but it's something you want to think about. If you're going to respond with this extra speech markup, how are you going to get the markup in the document itself? Um, that's sort of a, an open-ended question, I think. So now that we've got the, the code side of things working, we can go back and finish that configuration that we talked about. So um, Amazon has some really good docs that sort of walk you through how they're going to test your skill when it comes to validation and getting it actually in the, the app marketplace. There's a little built-in service simulator right on the configuration form. So you can type in the thing that the user would say, and then it'll make a request and respond back. It'll show you both the JSON, and there's a little audio file that will represent what the Alexa would, would read back to you. And then um, if you enable the development version of your skill, you can enable that on your Alexa, and then actually interact with a real device uh, testing different voice commands as well. And then in order to get it published, like I mentioned, you have to pass their certification process. So that involves having a description, an icon that will be recognizable in the App Store. Uh, there's a big submission checklist about doing things like test and make sure every possible slot value returns a response and not errors. Um, we found that in publishing skills, that usually that process usually happens overnight. It's, it's pretty fast. Uh, and the turnaround for uh, once you submit it the first time, if you fail anything, make fixes and submit it again, end to end was about... 48 hours, basically. I mean, it was sort of every morning I would wake up and have an answer on whether it was certified or not, which was pretty neat. And then after your skill goes live on the developer portal, they have this idea of like a dev version. So you can keep your live skill out there, create a dev version, make changes to that, but it has to repass the certification process again before that version will be live um, for your end users. So this is sort of what that looks like. Uh, in practice. You can you can be working on one while you have another version live, which I'm sure we're all familiar with doing something similar with our Drupal sites. So the Alexa skills, not really much different. All right, so let's get to some demos. Um, and this is like special demo time because I like hardware and Arduino stuff. So um, there is an echo dot there you can see in the corner, and so that's what's actually going to process the request. But it's going to. Alexa. Yeah. Ask fish jokes for a joke. What Drupal model do you use to organize schools of fish? Organic grouper. <laughs> Thank you, yes. And then this uh, demonstrates a different activation word. Alexa, open fish jokes. Why don't fish play basketball? Because they're afraid of the net. So that demonstrates where we didn't need a slot or a category. We didn't even need to ask for a joke. All we needed to say was Alexa, open, and then the name of the skill. So here's a demonstration of fish jokes with a category slot. Alexa. Ask fish jokes for a silly joke. Why do fish always know how much their food weighs? They have a lot of scales. And then here's another, yeah, yeah, it's a groaner. <laughs> Ask fish jokes for a nerd joke. What Drupal model do you use to organize schools of fish? Organic grouper. I thought that would get a little more reaction from the Drupal crowd, but anyway. So that's um, how we can deal with two different uh, slots. And then um, I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation that there's a different type of skill called a flash briefing, which is like a glorified, it's basically a voice RSS feed. So here's an example of a flash briefing. We created a Drupalize Me flash briefing. 
which reads the summary field of our latest blog post. Alexa, what's my flash briefing? Here's your flash briefing. For the Drupal Eyes Meet, Drupal Eyes Me will be offering our Drupal 8 theme workshop at Twin Cities Drupal Camp on June 22nd, as well as delivering sessions and attending the sprints. We would love to see you there. That's all from your flash briefing. So the reason why you just say, Alexa, give me my flash briefing instead of Alexa, give me my Drupal Eyes Me flash briefing is that in your Alexa app, you can actually add multiple flash briefings. So you could add NPR and the weather and Drupal Eyes Me or whatever it is. And so then you could say, Alexa, give me my flash briefing and it would read through all of those. So it's like when you just cannot be bothered in the morning, you just want to drink your coffee and have things read to you, that's what you could use that for. So that's a specific type of skill. And one one of the lessons learned from that was um, I tried it at first with just our like default RSS blog feed and it super choked on all of the um, like if there was a link tag in there it started to read greater than sign ampersand semicolon and it was a disaster so I had to just create a new views display that uh, stripped out all of those tags and uh, made sure that it's a nice clean text for Alexa to read. And in case you're interested, in case you're interested in tinkering, this is just the how things were connected up. I had a, an Arduino and an, a, a motor shield, and there are these toy hobby motors um, inside the fish, and those are connected to the motor shield. There is a headphone out port in the Echo Dot that um, is split, um, and it goes to two places. So it goes to um, a little speaker so that you can actually hear what's going on. And then uh, it's soldered to the board. So the analog, uh, the other end is soldered to the, the analog zero uh, input. So this, the Arduino script is just looking for a signal, an, an analog signal. And when it gets to a th certain threshold, it's like, oh, there's signal here, move the mouse, <laughs> start up the motor and, and spin it up. So. That's how, um, so that, that's how that works. If you want to build your own fish-enabled Echo Dot, you can go to this tutorial on instructables.com. Just look for Animate a Billy Bass Mouth with Any Audio Source by Donald Bell. So to recap, um, in this session, we went through the Alexa skill creation process and how you could integrate that with your Drupal site or not. Um, we went through the voice design process, how the interaction model works, and three ways to create a custom skill with and without Drupal integration. So we hope that you're feeling inspired and energized to go out and create your own custom Alexa skills and integrate them with Drupal. Check out uh, Blake's uh, GitHub repo, the Alexa uh, docs on um, both the, the voice design process docs and also um, the docs that you can get to after you uh, create your Amazon developer account. We've got a minute left. Are there any uh, questions uh, that you that any of you have? Yes. What is your experience with how natural it feels with the questions that you write? Like, does it do any sanitize, sanitization at all of like the and to and stuff like that, or is it like verbatim? It's really strict. Yeah. Um, it's pretty forgiving because really, like I mentioned, if I just say Alexa ask fish jokes and even if I like start choking on my drink or like get interrupted it, it's gonna be like oh well I heard that so I'm gonna return this random joke but um, so it's it's pretty forgiving if your skill is the single turn dialogue and really like anything you say to it with the name of your skill if you at least get the invocation name right it's gonna return a joke where it gets a little more particular is if you have like specific information like give me the weather for Minneapolis you know it's going to default to whatever location you have in a, uh, configured on your app but if you want something in particular then you need to have the sample utterances so I would say that it's a little bit of both it, it depends on how particular you need your uh, you want your responses to be but what's nice about it is if you at least if they get the invocation name right and if they at least say open launch or ask in the name of your skill they'll get something so 
Uh, I'll also add that in the process of, of working on this, um, after work hours, my five-year-old figured out how to do it, and she's not the clearest speaker on earth. So, um, yeah, you can. It's one of those things where you can sort of code defensively to make sure that it'll respond even if it doesn't get all the contextual info. Yeah, we'll be around. If you have more questions, we'd love to talk about it. Blake's got an Echo Dot with him. Um, uh, I don't. I don't. But if you if you want to chat with us, uh, we'll be around all weekend, and we'll be around today. So. Would love to talk more about it. It's just a fun, fun thing to do. And the Echo Dots are like 50 bucks, so it's a, it's a relatively cheap way to get started. Um, and I would recommend that device as a getting started device. Thank you all very much. Thanks.